Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to tonight's event, uh, Internment as a Technology of Governance, Xinjiang, Assam, Refugee Camps, and the U.S. Prison System. Uh, I'm uh, Nathan Hill, and I'm a um, professor of uh, Chinese uh, studies here at uh, Trinity College Dublin uh, and um, director of the Center for Asian Studies. I uh, just want to uh, extend my heartfelt uh, thanks to, to Tris, the Trinity uh, Research in Social Sciences, which is uh, co-hosting this event along with uh, the Center for Asian Studies, and in particular to Maeve, who has been um, uh, uh, brilliantly handling all of the technicalities uh, with uh, uh, charm and grace. Um, right, so then about... Um, Tonight's event, and and I, let me just make me clear that uh, make clear that what I'm about to say is just a kind of meant as a sort of um, etiological explanation of you know how we've come to be here tonight, and and not meant to, to editorialize or uh, to communicate any uh, particular facts. Uh, but I have uh, personally watched over over the last five years as with concern as uh, um, events have unfolded in Xinjiang. And with some consternation as to why they had been so uh, so little remarked upon, uh, and then quite suddenly, uh, you know, uh, then they began to be uh, remarked upon, and and I I'm also a little bit uh, confused about uh, that sudden uh, change, uh, and there have been you know lots of discussions, uh, most of them critical. Uh, but that criticism has, has to me, seemed like it, it isn't sort of, to use a technical term, imminent, right? So, like, it's, it's, it seems like it's not really um, kind of formulated in terms that the Chinese state would uh, understand or recognize. Uh, and it's also not, you know, to use the contrasting term, transcendent in the sense that it, it didn't take a, a comparative or global or historicized uh, context in, in mind. And uh, in the course of the pandemic, as uh, the news became more aware of developments in Xinjiang, uh, I personally uh, remarked on what seemed to me, in some ways, analogous news stories, in particular, um, the horrific discoveries uh, in Canada related to the um, residential schools program. Looking a little bit further back in time, uh, there have been, of course, similar um, Kind of reckonings with the past, uh, even here in Ireland, uh, with regard to the uh, Madeleine Laundries, uh, industrial schools, and mother and baby homes. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm not an expert in Ireland or Canada, and neither is anyone here. <laughs> um, but <laughs> we we do have experts in uh, in uh, what I think are relevant uh, contexts to consider for uh, thinking about internment as a technology of governance. And uh, to then begin, uh, I give you uh, uh, Darren Byler, who is a, a sociocultural anthropologist at Simon Fraser University, uh, who is teaching and research examines the dispossession of stateless peoples through forms of contemporary capitalism and colonialism in China, Central Asia, and Southeast Asia. So you can take it away, Darren. Well, great. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, and thank you, Nathan, for organizing this. Um, I think thinking comparatively about these issues is really crucial to understanding the historical moment we're living in um, and, and how these things are not unique to, to one uh, particular space. Um, my research is focused on Xinjiang, the Uyghur Autonomous Region in, in Northwest China. It's a, a space the size of Alaska, a massive desert and mountain landscape that's home to around 12 million Uyghurs, which is a Turkic Muslim group and another million and a half um, uh, Kazakh folks, uh, another million Hui people, which are all Muslim groups who are affected by it and by the current systems there. Um, to understand this, why this is happening, uh, we need to go back to the 1990s, which is when China was becoming a manufacturer for the world um, and really needing access to natural resources, infrastructure, uh, 
um, was built across Xinjiang in order to get access to those resources, which is oil, natural gas, and coal. And then over time, as that infrastructure was put in place, the roads and, and pipelines, um, they began to develop industrial uh, farming, particularly cotton farming and tomato farming. And so in a lot of ways, Xinjiang, uh, with the support of the government, became a, a sort of peripheral colony for, for resources needed in the industrial east. Um, this was part of an open up the Northwest campaign and later an open up the West campaign um, that was from the state's perspective, set out to, to integrate the Uyghur population with the rest of China. What happened along the way though, was that the, the local institutions in these Uyghur majority areas were really captured by the, the new populations of people that came to build the infrastructure and develop the resources. Um, and so the Uyghurs saw themselves really being pushed to the side in, in, in particular ways. Um, the earliest forms of violence that appeared were really connected to resource issues, to irrigation rights. Um, there was often a, an, a discussion of, of Uyghurness um, and Islam as, as part of that conversation. Um, but if you look at sort of the material circumstances that people were operating out of, it was had more to do with, with the resources. Um, in the 2000s, the you know, state was aware that this was happening and they began a labor transfer program that moved Uyghurs from rural areas to urban centers in the east to work in factories. But there again, there was conflict between different groups of migrants, between Han migrants and Uyghur migrants, which sparked violence. Um, and that in turn led to protests back in the Uyghur region and eventually riots, um, which brought about the, the the beginning of a police state with you know, hundreds of thousands of police um, moving into this space over time, didn't happen all right away. Um, and you know, they weren't always there, uh, but it was markedly um, present. So when I started my field work in the region in 2011, there was armed police on, on pretty much every uh, street corner in the Uyghur majority areas. Um, and there was, you know, a lot of arrests of young Uyghurs, particularly young men. Um, the, the systems that were put in place really began to mirror or echo forms of military science or policing science that was used in other places. The counterinsurgency theory was something that, that the, the Chinese police were interested in and during understanding how you could break up Uyghur networks. Um, to begin to control um, what they saw as an emerging insurgency. Um, although there isn't really evidence that, that Uyghurs were organized in a very uh, systematic way, um, it was mostly about resource issues. Uh, that's the sort of um, policing science that began to, to emerge. And I'm bringing that into this discussion because that's something that you know, we've seen in many different places around the world, how military science comes back home and becomes used in policing. Um, in the 2010s, uh, sort of information warfare and predictive policing uh, began to emerge, which is something we see happening along with um, you know, breakthroughs in uh, mass uh, data analysis, um, really artificial intelligence, being able to sort through mass amounts of data to look for patterns um, and in the Uyghur context, this was used to track Uyghur discussions online. It took some time for the, for the state to develop these kinds of tools, and they were working mostly with private industry to do it. Um, the 2014 incident in Kunming, where there was large scale violence um, carried out by a, a group of Uyghurs, killing over 30 Han people, was really a turning point in the sort of political will to develop these kinds of tools. Um, that incident was referred to as China's 9-11. Um, and you see almost immediately afterwards that the large tech players like Alibaba um, and iFly Tech, which does voice recognition, said that they would now begin to, to really work directly with, the, with state security to assess uh, terrorist activity online. What, what's happening though with this assessment is that they're, they're really beginning to define what is terrorism or what is extremism in very broad ways. And here they're really drawing on predictive policing ideas or countering, countering violent extremism ideas, which in, in the UK is, is referred to as prevent. Um, 
And here it's about stopping people from being radicalized by preventing them from, from you know, really um, accessing or, or, or following through on, on pious forms of Islamic practice. There's a lot of problems with CVE theory because it conflates piety or religious practice with violence when there's not necessarily a correlation. Um, but this is nevertheless how the state began to think about it. And they began to assess Uyghur digital histories going back to around 2010, looking through the sort of social networks that people had on, on WeChat, which is a social media app. Um, and that's when they really began to uh, decide or sort through the population, decide who is trustworthy or untrustworthy. Um, the policing theory literature from Xinjiang talks about how they're looking for forms of extremism or terrorism that are, quote, not serious. Um, and so they can be nipped in the bud. Um, the, the state, you know, invested around $100 billion in security infrastructure, mostly in the surveillance stuff, but also in the actual material infrastructure of camps. Um, I think the reflex to turn to camps really comes out of the, you know, the Maoist history of the use of camps in the 1960s um, and 70s, um, and also in the 1990s in relation to the Falun Gong. Um, but this camp system that they're, they're building, they built in Xinjiang, is really maybe the first of its type in, in China, where it's a purpose-built, very sophisticated, um, technologically sophisticated system, um, and is really meant to target an entire population of an, of an ethnic or several ethnic minorities. Um, the, the state um, also prosecuted around 500,000 people in addition to those that were detained. We see that in the, in the state records of, since 2017. And we also know that several hundred thousand of the people that were initially detained have since been moved into factory spaces that are associated with, with the camps. Um, in addition to those that have been sent to factories, hundreds of thousands more of what you could call the able-bodied poor have been sent from uh, rural areas to work in factories without having to go to the camps at all. And these are people that are, are coming out of what they call the general population or the normal population, not the untrustworthy people. So in general, what's happened here is a, is a really radical transformation, a sort of forced proletarianization of the Uyghur population, turning them from rural farmers into factory workers, um, but within a sort of controlled space. Um, because you know, inside the factories and, and camps, of course, there's lots of technology and surveillance checkpoints, but outside of them, there's checkpoints as well. Um, and because they're using quite sophisticated face recognition uh, assessment tools and also data assessment tools that can plug into people's phones, um, they're tracking people using GPS and, and, and so on. Um, once you're on a watch list, it's very difficult for you to, to leave the sort of permitted spaces where you're allowed to be. Um, and so it's a, a sort of form of, uh, form of control that, that's kind of unprecedented in terms of its technological ability. Now, part of what's happening here is in addition to you know, wanting to turn the Uyghurs into workers is uh, that the state is also moving towards what they call a, a Zhonghua Minzu, a national identity um, that seeks to de-emphasize ethnic difference and instead say, we should all be Chinese first, where we should have a Chinese identity. And one of the ways that they're doing that in the, in the Uyghur space is they've hired around 89,000 new teachers um, since 2017 to work in the public schools. Um, and as you look at, through the ads, it says quite clearly that to be a teacher, to qualify, you have to have a high school degree, you need to speak Chinese, you need to have a non-religious background, and you need to be committed to anti-terrorism. Um, so it's, it's a, a, a sort of transformation of education system. And I think the state is really thinking that the next generation of Uyghurs and Kazakhs, that the young children that are in these schools, that they're the ones that will be fully transformed or, or re-educated away from the sort of identities that they had before. So the story I'm telling here is, is a complicated one. Um, and the source of it is, is complex as well. There's not just one factor. It's not just that Xi Jinping or Chen Tongguo, the leaders of, this bit of, of, of the Uyghur region in China, um, you know, have it out for the Uyghurs. Um, it was initially economics that drove this, you know, the desire for resources. Then it was, you know, 
we have this dissatisfied population, how should we deal with them? And then they turn to global policing theory and also a good dose of Islamophobia that's coming out of the global war on terror. Then there's tech development that's happening simultaneously. And so, you know, tech began to lead in some ways as well. And then there's this policy push to, to, to turn the Chinese state into this sort of homogeneous, um, you know, ethno state. Um, there's of course always concerns about the national economy um, and maintaining growth. Um, some of the companies that have moved to Xinjiang are, are, are companies that are at over capacity in their home regions. And so they're needing um, places to develop. There's also issues having to do with labor in Eastern China where labor is leaving China and going to Vietnam because of uh, rising labor costs. And then on top of all of that, there's the, the development initiative, the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative that is, um, about China's going out into the world and really sort of um, developing a, a global position um, in particularly the developing world. And the, the Uyghur region, because it's right next to Central Asia and South Asia is, is, is seen as a, a, a sort of key hub in that project. So it's a complex story, but there's a, a lot of economic and political factors that are coming together, Coloet coalescing here to, to, to make it produce what it's, well, the effects that we see. So I'll stop there um, and I'll look forward to hearing from the others and, and further conversation. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for this extremely uh, clear and insightful summary of developments in Xinjiang. Uh, and uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Meyer Suresh, who is a lecturer at uh, SOAS University of London in the School of Law. Uh, his research uh, seeks to bring an anthropological perspective to the study of legal processes. Uh, and he co edited a book, um, The Shifting Scales of Justice, the Supreme Court in Neoliberal uh, India. Uh, but uh, uh, now he has been doing um, some research uh, in Assam that he'll be telling us about presently. Um, thank you for that, Nathan. and. Um... Yeah, and thank you to Dan for that really insightful present presentation about really horrifying circumstances. Um, um, I just want to say that the the my research and uh, kind of want to pre preface my kind of my comments on Assam with kind of two big caveats. One is that my I'm moving into this kind of field of research, and these um, re re issues related to internment citizenship are kind of new research areas for me. So I look forward to your questions. It kind of prompts for further research. Um, and second, I'm kind of aware of pitfalls of identity, especially questions of who speaks where. Um, and questions like this are so fraught, especially in places like Assam, which is so, um, which, in which politics is so contingent on the idea of outsider and insider. Um, so I come across, come to this topic as a person who seeks to highlight kind of human costs of uh, laws that are passed in the name of preserving both national security and identity. And it builds off my previous research on um, kind of ethnographies of terrorism laws um, in India. Um, so many of you would have heard um, or might have read a couple of years ago that the Indian state of Assam basically was on the path to denationalizing or stripping the citizenship of about just under 2 million people, 1.9 million people. Um, through um, through this process called the National Register of Citizens. I just want to give a kind of a brief history of that context before I go on to questions of um, detention that the National Register of Citizens or the NRC has led to. Um, it's about 300 years of history, so I'm going to kind of put that down into, into a very short bit over here, a couple of minutes over here. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Assam kind of is in the northeast of India. Um, it's uh, by far the biggest state in the India's Northeast. Um, to the north, it's bordered by Bhutan, and in the south, it's bordered by Bangladesh. And kind of the issues around identity of who's Assamese and who's not Assamese kind of go back, to, or in um, the rendering of some historians of the region, go back to colonial, colonial period. When um, in 1757, when the area of Bengal, that's now Bangladesh and parts of West Bengal, were brought into um, British control. Um, they pushed the border upwards, um, kind of displacing ethnic As uh, Assamese further up north, um, and kind of settled agriculture in, um, in the areas of what is now Assam. So the first wave of migrant labor was for the tea plantations that were being set up, 
Um, and the kind of second wave um, of migration happened in the later 1800s um, with um, the, the colonial state having this explicit um, uh, um, policy of settling uh, Bengalis um, from, from Bangladesh, what is now Bangladesh and West Bengal into the plains of Assam to cultivate jute. And there's an 1891 census that estimated about one fourth of Ass Assam's population at the time was migrant in origin. Um, two further events propelled migration into Assam from what is today Bangladesh. Um, the first being the partition of the subcontinent in 1947, which led to an estimated 5 million people entering Assam. Um, and the Bangladesh War of Independence um, and the events preceding that and the genocide preceding that um, around 1971, which led to an estimated 10 million people entering Assam um, and its neighboring states. Um, so this, this kind of protracted lengthy forms of migration so the story goes, led to um, um, exacerbations in anxieties over the loss of Assamese identity. Um, the, there's been a long running Assam movement even during the colonial period, um, but it kind of took off in the 60s and 70s with the um, influx of people from Bangladesh, uh, from what is now Bangladesh. Um, so the Assamese movement kind of took off in the 60s and kind of demanded um, the protection of Assamese culture, demanded state-led protection of Assamese culture and language, and wanted to impose um, Assamese teaching in all schools, uh, wanted to have Assamese cultural programming, um, and government business only being conducted in Assamese. Um, the, the high point of the Assam movement was in the 70s, just after um, the Bangladesh War, War of Independence. Um, and this the Assam movement, as it is now known, was spearheaded by an organization called the All Assam Students Youth Union. And one of the primary aims of um, ASU, the All Assam Student Union, was uh, the detection and deportation of all foreigners, right? And so this, this idea, detection, deportation of all foreigners, became a central plank in Assamese politics for a very long time, even to the present day. Um, the Assam, All Assam Students Union organized general strikes, um, it organized mass pickets, um, but the but the um, kind of the the, viol the the political fervor of that also led to acts of mass violence um, against ethnic Bengalis. And one of the most horrific were, was, I think, where 2,000 ethnic Bengalis were killed in an afternoon um, in a place called Nelly in uh, rural Assam. Um, so the political disturbance led to an accord being signed between the government of India and the Assam movement, and had a number of 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 um, uh, kind of points in that in that political agreement. Um, however, the, the main point for us today to think about is um, the agreement that basically mandated that all persons entered after who entered India, who entered Assam after March 25th, 1971, were again to be detected and deported by the Indian government. Um, since then, the Indian government has kind of gone back and forth on this. Um, it's kind of let the issue simmer a bit. Um, but in the meantime, it's it's it has done taken steps um, uh, which have which have now exacerbated the situation. Um, so the Indian government at the time in the when the accord was signed in 1985 in the in the mid 80s. Um, set up some something called um, uh, foreigners tribunals these foreigners tribunals were were aimed to um, were aimed at detecting and deporting foreign uh, people who are alleged to be foreigners so the foreigners tribunals were set up in 1985 in assam and by some accounts statistics are a bit um uh, sketchy over here but for some by one account the most authoritative account that i found is that 86 people have been declared as foreigners and there are th th currently 80 sorry 86 000 people have de been declared as foreigners and currently there are about 83 000 cases pending between before before the foreigners tribunals right um and it's the most uh, the, another um thing that the indian government did was to go through voter rolls and allow people to file objections to voter registrations so wherever um there was a um a person who was of doubtful um citizenship um the authorities put a d next to that person's name to indicate that this person was a doubtful voter and this kind of intersected with the foreigners um uh tribunal process in various ways, which we can talk about later on if we come to it. Um, but the most contentious measure that was put in place by the Indian government was something called the National Register of Citizens, um, which is often known as the NRC. Despite its name, um, in its current form, 
it's a register that lists all Indian citizens in the state of Assam. So it's almost as if a question of national citizenship for the state of Assam has been, de been devolved to the, the government of Assam. Um, so even though the first NRC was conducted of, uh, was in 1951, and there was not much um, uh, political salience to it at that point, um, it kind of the it, the the NRC kind of kind of simmered in the background uh, with with no particular um, uh, effect on the process till about till about 2013. Um, so earlier on in, in 2003, the government started this process of having a national mandated ID card, um, and this process um, was associated with all India process. But it acquired a certain salience in Assam, which was, and, and the Assamese movement was still very concerned about Assamese identity, right? So, um, in a series, very complicated court case, which I won't get into over here, the Supreme Court mandated that the NRC process begin um, immediately, right? So, this was a Supreme Court supervised process. Um, and according to the NRC process, every Assam resident who claimed Indian citizenship had to prove that their ancestry in the state predated March 25th, 1971. So the same date that the Assam, um, that was put in, uh, into law in the Assam Accord was repeated over here. Um, so the, the authorities mandated a specified list of documents that would be accepted of proof of ancestry. Once you had these documents, you submitted them to an authority and the authority would decide whether these, where these, um, whether these documents are um, valid or, or whether they've been forged or what to do in case where you don't have documents, right? So in a milieu where, you know, documents, um, their authenticity and completeness is always suspect, the set of the, a mad scramble um, to obtain documents and to figure out a way in which um, you can, that people start to buttress their validity. Um, by early um, 2018, about 230, sorry, early 2018, 33 million people had submitted the documents. In July 2018, the government released a draft um, NRC where the list of 4 million people were, were not included. Um, those left out of the NRC, uh, of the draft NRC, were, light, were allowed to file objections against their, include, against their exclusion. Right? In August 2019, a final list was published, leaving out the names of 1.9 million people. That's about 6% of Assam's population. Um, out of the NRC. Those um, left out of the NRC risk being declared as foreigners unless they can prove in the foreigners tribunals that they are Indian citizens. Um, and so just a brief word on the process over here. So it, it's the burden of proof is on the individual proving that you have to is on the individual seeking to claim Indian citizenship. Right? It's not as if someone is saying you are not an Indian citizen. You have to show that you are an Indian citizen, right? Which is a much more difficult burden of proof to meet, especially in a context where the high literacy documents are suspect, documents are incomplete, right? Um, and the foreigners tribunal process. So there's a recent, well, last year, um, a report by a co -report, co authored report by Cornell Law School and a university in India called National University for Judicial Sciences, analyzed the foreigner, foreigner's tribunal process. And there are all sorts of due process um, issues with that, um, with the foreigner's tribunal process. First amongst which is that the, the tribunal tribunals are, um, um, tribunal members are appointed directly by the government. They don't have any judicial training. And there are unconfirmed media reports that um, that many of these uh, uh, tribunal officers have been given un informal quotas to figure out how informal quotas on how many people to declare as foreigners, right? Um, but the question then arises: is what to do with these newly determined illegal immigrants or foreigners? And so the Indian government and the government of Assam has begun constructing detention centers in Assam. Um, right now, six detention centers are al already in operation within jail compounds, um, and other specific specific uh, jail um, detention centers are being um, constructed right now. Um, the one nearing completion, it can hold around 3,000 people. But obviously, to hold 1.9 million people, a whole level of infrastructure needs to be built up a bit over here. Um, I just want to stress over here that the Assam movement, I, movement's idea of identity and ethnicity was not was an ethnic one, not a religious one, right? So hence, for the Assam movement at least, both Hindus and Muslims could be authentic Assamese. 
um, and their targets were both Hindu, Hindu and Muslim Bengalis, right? I think this nuance is important to remember because it becomes easy to forget it, given the way in which the NRC has been used in Indian national politics. Um, the present Hindu right-wing government has made targeting Muslims one of its central policies, even if it's unstated, um, it's, it's clearly targeted at Muslims. Um, the present Home Minister um, has turned all, has said that all Bangladeshis read Bengali Muslims um, as cockroaches, implying that they need to be exterminated. Um, the national government, at least at the local level, pitched the NRC as a way of getting rid of, of Muslim foreigners and planned an all India wide exercise known as the National Population Register, which would follow a very similar format. All people within, the, within all of India who claimed Indian citizenship had to prove their citizen, right? And had to prove their citizenship. Um, accordingly, it's in, instructed states to begin construction of detention camps in all major cities in order to de detain people who had been wrongfully granted Indian citizenship. Um, and its hope uh, in, the, in a kind of a state in a way dog whistle way was that both the NRC and, and the NPR, the National Register of Citizens and the National Population Register would help eliminate if not re remove um, Muslims from the Indian population. However, when the final NRC was published, um, the Indian national government faced a problem. A high proportion of those excluded from the list were Hindu. Um, and to cut a very long, st complicated story short, uh, the Indian government introduced an amendment to the Citizenship, Citizenship Act to enable those Hindus who were excluded, to, um, excluded from the NRC to apply for Indian citizenship, but would render Muslims unable to do so. Uh, this amendment, which would allow Bengali Hindus who were excluded from the NRC to apply for Indian citizenship, led to widespread protests in Assam, because remember, they did not want Bengalis, either Hindu or Muslim, to be allowed to end, to allow to live in Assam. Um, but I just want to turn briefly, I probably don't have that, that much time left, to the detention centers themselves. The national government has sent mixed messages on the issues, um, at, at times celebrating the constructions and at times denying that they even exist. So on a day that, uh, on one day um, last year, um, the Home Minister basically circulated something called the Model Detention Center Manual that's enabling, um, that was a guidance for state governments to construct um, on how to construct detention centers. The next day, the prime minister said, there's no such thing as a detention center um, in our country. So it's clearly some disinformation is going on over here. Um, but turning to the model detention center manual itself, um, the excerpts are only partial excerpts are available. Um, and in these excerpts, the manual is a pain to, deten to distinguish the detention center from a jail, even though there are several existing detention centers that are located within prisons themselves. Um, it emphasizes things like inmates should be housed as families. Um, they should lead um, a normal life within the detention center. There should be creches. There should be ways of, of, of uh, employment. There should be internet access, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but who knows? Not the, we, no one has actually seen uh, uh, the inside of a newly constructed detention center. Um, uh, earlier this year, the Assam government decided to rename all detention center as transit camps. And according to one government official, and I'm not really sure how to characterize the statement, and I'm just quoting it, um, the change of nomenclature is to give a more just and humane look to the whole thing. The phrase detention center appears like concentration camps. Um, and so he's kind of drawing an analogy that everyone had in their heads anyways. Um, but um, so the question over here for me, for I think is this, it's, it's quite interesting, is this, right? Um, so the potentially, uh, so after the 1.9 million million people right now, um, who have been stripped of the citizenship in the state of Assam. And potentially all of those 1.9 million people could be detained in these detention centers, right? Um, statistics, like I said, are hard to come by, but one estimate puts the number of people um, who are actually in the deta detention centers right now at 1,900. Um, the government's own figure puts that at 379. Some of those people who have been detained in the detention centers have been in there for 10 years or more and have no foreseeable opportunity of release 
um, because Bangladesh doesn't recognize these people as its citizens. Um, and despite in the Indian government's desire to paint these um, uh, detention centers as humane, um, uh, conditions inside have been described as akin to torture, and suicides by detainees um, often make uh, reports of suicide by detain detainees often make their way into um, popular media, uh, international media. Um, those who remain outside the detention detention center are no less unfree and lead a very precarious life. Um, according to Mohsin Bhatt, one of the scholars who's worked on this area, people who've been left out of the NRC face a constant threat that they may eventually be detained indefinitely. Yeah. And even though they, were no, they are notionally free outside the detention center, they've been stripped of all material benefits of citizenship. They can't vote um, certain forms of employment, certain forms of ownership, um, and certain welfare, welfare benefits from the state have been, have been excluded from them simply because they, cannot, they are no longer citizens in the eyes of the state. And obviously there's a fear of even approaching the state for fear that you may be outed as um, a person who, of, of doubtful citizenship. So in the end, maybe I want to just um, end with several questions prompted by the title of the, pa of the panel. Um, and it's really this, like in a context where the Indian government has been expanding its capacity to, to, to detain people, it deems as foreigners, and in a context where the Indian state is not shy in detaining people, it regularly detains people for 10 years without charge. And it's not, it's not shy to do, um, it's not shy to do that. Um, but in this context, in Assam, where it's detained so few, what does it mean to take, think of detention as a, as a technique of governance? Um, does it point to the idea that mass detention is a perpetual threat, um, or mass indefinite detention is a perpetual threat to use against inconvenient populations? Um, or does it ask, her think of, think, ask us to think of precariousness of life outside the detention center as itself a form of imprisonment. That's a metaphor being used by people um, who, are, who have gone through the NRC process. Or does it seek to point out um, the idea of a state that is performing its authority by constructing detention centers, um, even though people aren't actually detained in them. Um, so I'll end it over there. And thank you again um, to Nathan and Tris and May for inviting me and for organizing this session. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Bayer, for uh, that extremely um, interesting uh, presentation. And uh, now we turn to our uh, third panelist, uh, who is uh, Annette uh, Bachmann. Annette is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Siegen uh, in the Department of uh, General Sociology. Uh, she has been researching refugee camps and border regions in Asia since 2008. And uh, I take this opportunity to congratulate her on her uh, brand new book uh, in 2021 uh, called uh, Public Camp Orders and the Power of uh, Microstructures. So you can yeah, take it away. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I will share my screen. Um, so, I will talk about refugee camp governance and the power of microstructures in camp governance systems. So I guess I'm talking about a case that is more of a maximum contrast to the cases of my fellow presenters um, that are talking um, about. But still, we are all talking about different forms of internment. In the first part of my presentation, I don't see my presentation anymore. Ah, now I see it. Um, sorry. Um, I'm giving a quite general answer to the question of why people who are fleeing their country or even are fleeing within a country are placed in camps. In the second part of my presentation, I will take a closer look at local phenomena in refugee camps that goes beyond the usual conception of camps um, simply as a governance technology produced um, by states. First of all, camps are, or forms of internment, different forms of internment are a globally widespread instrument and the technology of political rule 
used by dictatorships as well as democracies. Camps are part of a transnational institutional history and shape not only the politics of the 20th century as accentuated by Sigmund Baumann, but also the international politics of the present, as we can see at the European Union's external borders. But displacement is actually an ongoing challenge in regions in the global south and not in Europe. That's why the majority of refugee camps or refugee settlements are located in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, where according to UNHCR, around six to seven million people are accommodated. But they are financed primarily by Western donors and organized by humanitarian agencies from the United States, European Union, and Japan. That is why we need to understand that refugee camps, especially in the global south, are a product of the international community. And refugee camps are and remain an international and not only regional or national answer to forced migration flows. The political rationality behind building refugee camps is quite simple. Camps seem to have or seem to give a somewhat plausible organizational answer to the question of how to deal with mass influxes of people who are fleeing and who are unwanted. It has been assumed that centralized accommodations are less expensive and make it easier to support, but also to regulate and control people. In this way, camps enable, for example, an administratively efficient model for aid delivery bureaucratic acts, but also control. In addition, it is anticipated that the problem of a high number of populations seeking temporary protection is thereby contained in a camp bubble in order that these populations do not cause trouble or, initi or initiate transformative changes in the host countries. Moreover, it is presumed that as soon as the situation changes, it will be simpler to organize and enforce the return of these populations and to close the camps again. Moreover, we have to understand that refugees and stateless people, as well as refugee camps, are the logical consequence of the global norm of the nation state system, where every person must belong to a territory and a people. This answer has been given already by Hannah Arendt in her popular essay, We Refugees, as well as her considerations in the origins of totalitarianism. Refugees are perceived as a threat to the normal order of our global nation state system, but at the same time are the necessary other and support of this order. This ambitious relationship of exclusion and inclusion of the figure of the refugee as well as stateless people is rediscussed by the anthropologist Lisa Maki and the political scientist Nifsat Sokuk. As a consequence, the attempt by states to order people with political status guarantees the constant creation of refugees as well as stateless people. And yes, this exclusion does, of course, often, but not exclusively concern ethnic and religiously constructed groups. I would rather rephrase the statement made in the description of this panel. It mainly concerns, and this is important to understand, those groups of people who are in conflict with the state government, the national government, of their origin or are ca characterized by the government as a group of people who are not supposed to be part of their society or are not wanted to be part of society or the specific state. And this argument can certainly applied, be applied to all camp systems or forms of internment. In the second part of my presentation, it is for important for me to emphasize, as I do in my book, Public Camp Orders and the Power of Microstructures, that um, camps 
do not function exclusively through a top-down government's technology or that camps can only be described and understood via a state technology or as a technology that results from the national order of things. In order to understand camp governance and camp orders, we need to include in the analysis the possibilities, but above all the necessities of the camp population and other locally present camp actors, such as local wardens, do deal with the camp government's technology. I would like to exemplify the power of microstructures with two selected empirical scenes that I encountered during my field work in Burmese refugee camps in Thailand. The first phenomena is inspired by Irving Goffman and describes the establishment of what I have called a situational performance of a total institution. In this performance, normality, the normal course of public camp life is suspended. The performance takes place as soon as state authorities appear who represent and enforce the service by the book regulations. When they are present, there are hardly any or no people to be seen on the streets. There are no cars or motorbikes driving around the camps, but they have been hidden behind houses and covers. The shops that are located at almost every house on the main road and the market has been closed. The checkpoints around the camps have become impermeable. Mobility and economy are virtually non-existent. But normally, regardless of this camp governance technology, which is supposed to make the camp impermeable, closed and lifeless, there's a lively going on at the market, in the shops and at the checkpoints, there's a normally a coming and going. So this performance of the total institution is on the one hand, of course, part of camp normality, but it is also part of camp governance. And we have to recognize that. Another phenomena that is an expression of powerful local microstructures can be found in what I have called, called good organizational reasons for wrong documentation. I have called this phenomena good organizational reasons for wrong or bad documentation because it makes sense that local authorities, local camp authorities, falsify documents for higher authorities. From the point of view of humanitarian, humanitarian agencies or state actors, this seems to be cheating or corrupt abuse of aid, but for the maintenance of law and order on the ground, it makes total sense to falsify these documents. And I see this and understand this also as part of camp governance. These um, empirical phenomena illustrate these microstructures established between local camp actors. These locally established microstructures are not detached from other legal and political rules and regulations by higher authorities. In the situations in which they are established, they are a reaction to other regulations, but they do not always have to be. They can react to rules or camp governance and modify them, but they are also able to establish new camp rules. I have described this, for example, in relation to the legal system of refugee camps where state law um, does not have to be relevant for the administration for, of justice in camps. So other jurisdictions are relevant to legal practice because state law or international law are not enforced and practiced. In this context, it is also important to remember that camp governance is often characterized by the fact that it is partly highly regulated and partly has totally unregulated areas, at least on the part of the state. At the end of my presentation, I would like to re-emphasize the following. In order to study camp governance and camp, uh, camp theory, provides already satisfactory tools to grasp com camp complexities 
highlighting specifically the role of the external environment and the pro pro problematic character of camp governance. We should use this camp theory to better understand empirical phenomena also in context of all kinds of systems of internment. And by camp theory, I refer uh, to theoretical approaches, for example, given by Irving Goffman, Michel Foucault, of course, um, but also um, Arnold von Genep and Victor Turner, and of course, also Georgia Agampen and Hannah Arendt. These um, theoretical approaches, however, tend to underscore powerful camp structures, emphasizing the segregation, containment, exclusion, and exceptional character of camps where people are simply controlled, exposed to all power and domination, and have no or limited agency, or are excluded from law at all. Even though I think we learn a lot from these theories on camp governance, uh, certain aspects are lost from such kind of view. I have tried to make this clear um, with the scenes I presented and also the concept of powerful microstructures. But we also learn a lot from Foucault who lays the basis for my argument, so to speak. And I would like to uh, remind or um, um, state uh, Foucault's um, perspectives again. So for Foucault, power and maybe also governance is the product of all players and not simply a top-down mechanism. He emphasizes that power is being locally achieved and not binary, identifiable solely with the state, institutions, or an apparatus on the one hand and the oppressed on the other hand. So notably, Foucault underscores not only the complexity and fragmented character of power, but also how power emerges from local arenas of concrete action and practices. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, okay, and thank you very much uh, for, uh, for this presentation. And uh, now on to the fourth and uh, final presentation. I uh, would uh, like to introduce uh, Professor Kermit Ryder, uh, who is a professor of law and criminology at uh, UC Irvine. Uh, she studies prisons and prisoner rights uh, and uh, is building an in-prison uh, bachelor's program in California and also co-founded uh, the organization Prison Pandemic a living archive of incarcerated Californians' experiences of COVID-19. So um, you can uh, start talking, Carmen. Thank you. Um, so I think this is this has been so wonderful. I've I've learned so much, um, and I, I was thinking that what I would do is just talk a little bit about some of the surprising similarities between um, what I heard today and and what I tend to think about when I hear about things. Um, like camps and the Uyghurs and these exclusionary practices and policies um, and how surprisingly similar they can be to mass incarceration in the United States. Um, so uh, thinking through a, a few of uh, the similarities. So, um, you know, I think incarceration in the United States, many people have heard about mass incarceration and they think about the racial oppression and the idea of the new Jim Crow and incarceration in the United States as an extension of slavery in the Americas. Is a, is a commonly accepted idea now. Um, but I think that there are many other ways that are, are maybe talked about less in the mainstream culture um, in which incarceration in the United States is part of a politics of oppression that's kind of uh, it, part of this global um, continuity we're talking about for better or worse in, in terms of tools and techniques of oppression. Um, so, you know, people talk about exceptionalism in the United States that, you know, even though there is a kind of, a, a history of liberalism and and a set and sets of rights and democracy that simultaneously 
um, there's, you know, that that's that's one kind of exceptionalism, right? These these positive breadth of individual specified rights, and then there's also this exceptionalism of the negativity of our system of incarceration in terms of its scale, uh, that we have one of the highest rates of incarceration in the world, and also its duration. That for a um, democracy, um, people spend tend to spend longer in prison in the United States than in a lot of other places in the world. Um, so I think understanding the system, though, as not just simply a system of, of um, racialized oppression, as people talk about commonly, but a system of oppression, I want to kind of highlight three different ways in which it operates. Um, one, uh, to oppress social movements. Um, two, uh, to control and oppress labor. And three, um, to kind of use risk management as this tool uh, of oppression and sometimes a, a tool that um, I think uh, masks what's actually happening in terms of the oppression. So, and I hope that'll be kind of a place to think about. That's where I, I thought of a lot of resonance with what um, our other speakers said, and and also with uh, the pandemic that's raging um, across the globe, and particularly in prisons and camps and in these confined facilities where marginalized populations are being concentrated. Um, so, to talk about the first social movements, I think in the United States, incarceration has long played a role in repressing various forms of social organizations. Um, and my own expertise is in solitary confinement as a tool of control within prison. So, in the United States, people are sent into solitary confinement um, most often um, simply because of something they did wrong within the prison system through a very um, secret administrative process. When I think when Meyer was talking about how people haven't even been into the detention facilities he's, he's thinking and writing about, um, that's very common in the United States where solitary confinement is this very hidden practice. People often talk about it as a prison within a prison. And the administrative line about it is that it is for um, people who break prison rules or people who are too dangerous or difficult to manage in the prison system. But in practice, when we've looked at solitary confinement, it actually seems to um, control people who don't fit often for reasons of resistance in the prison system. And so a lot of my work is about how um, some of the most secure uh, and restrictive prisons in the United States were built in direct response to social movements and organizing, especially of African American prisoners um, in the 1970s and early 1980s in the United States. So, um, you know, we just celebrated, celebrated is perhaps the wrong word, but the 50th anniversary of the uprising at Attica, um, which had, uh, uh, you know, African American prisoners organizing for rights within prison. And um, similar things happened in California around the same time. And in in both states, we have um, a, a crackdown where all of those prisoners who participated, who remained inside, um, are placed into solitary confinement like units, and ultimately entire prisons are built to house them over decades. So that's just one example of um, the, the actual physical space of the prison being used to control uh, an attempt, often at nonviolent organizing. Um, and I think it's um, it, is, it isn't contained, right? One sees this repeat itself over and over again. And so um, I'm just, just um, getting calls from reporters today in the United States because of this, these horrific pictures of Haitian immigrants being um, whipped at the border in Texas that came out this week in the United States. And this question of um, what kind of oppression is happening to this, this influx of, of people coming to the border. And, it, and it's continuous, right? Sometimes people think of the US immigration system as separate from the mass incarceration system, but they're often sharing policies and practices, just as many of you described um, the phenomenon of camps being, as Annette was saying, the phenomenon of camps being global. Um, I think it's a similar thing here with these institutions. And so, you know, I've written about how um, in the United States, solitary confinement and immigration detention ends up looking a lot like solitary confinement in prisons where you target these groups um, that look uh, darker. African-Americans are 12 times as likely to be placed in solitary confinement and immigration detention as as their presence in the general population. Um, and, you know, there are many ways to read that, but I think is one trying to control, you know, a sense of these potentially radical, potentially organized groups and, and trying to control them through these tools. Um, so that's one piece is thinking about social movements, thinking about social movements as really interrelated with the question of, of race and the prison as a physical tool of confinement that shuts those down and isolates people from from um, communication. Uh, and, you know, I also think of the people on horseback on the border with whips as 
continuous with solitary confinement, right? These are, um, solitary confinement is a way of doing that much more secretly and without generating the kind of backlash that we see when we have the images. Um, and in fact, it is much harder to see the physical harm of solitary, but that in some ways makes it all the more disturbingly destructive. Um, so I think, you know, I think about a lot of these questions as, you know, not parsing off one practice as extreme and and divisible from all these other practices, but thinking them them as kind of this powerful network where the um, the institutions are are in a kind of dialogue with each other, reflecting each other in disturbing ways. Um, the second kind of control that comes out in the United States, and this this more echoes the conversation about the Uyghurs, I think, but incarceration in the United States, I think, is also an incredibly powerful tool to control labor. Um, and people often think about this in the United States in terms of prison privatization. We have private prisons, and so um, that's a way where we can make money off of the bodies of prisoners. And you hear about people um, in immigration detention, in particular, being forced to work for um, cents an hour. Um, and, and that being compared to slave labor. But I think that often misses the, the kind of bigger picture of the ways in which incarceration in the United States is just completely integrated into our economy and the ways in which it is oppressing labor. So, you know, only 10% of our prisons are actually privatized. Um, that often gets lost in the conversation. And yet many aspects of um, even public prisons are privatized. So all of the communications, all of the healthcare is privatized. And so that creates all kinds of profit even off of the, the allegedly publicly run institutions. And then, you know, in the United States, when you look at uh, unemployment rates, it, it's kind of um, distorted by the fact that we have millions of people incarcerated or millions and, and millions more people under supervision post-incarceration that often prevents their employment. And so we have a system that's kind of masking, I think, the rates of unemployment and the more people we have in prison, the lower the unemployment rate looks. So I just think there are many ways to think of prison, not just around racial and social movement oppression, but as a tool to control the labor markets, um, both in generating income through uh, jobs and finances and in oppressing income through um, making it impossible for some people to work and taking them out of the economy. Um, and then the third piece I wanna highlight, and this is something, I, I don't know, I would be very curious if people wanna talk about it more. It's a theme I've been thinking about through COVID in particular, is the role of risk management in the United States and really trying to grapple with it um, because um, one thing that I have been struck by is that the United States has a tendency to think, this is very broad strokes, but um, to think that all risk can be eliminated. And so when I look at our criminal justice policies, I see an attempt to eliminate any possibility of violent crime in the United States, to eliminate any possibility of recidivism. And so that's how people justify things like 500 year sentences for crimes or um, life sentences for three really minor crimes, right? The classic three strikes and your outlaw where you commit three minor um, thefts and you might be sentenced to prison in, for life in the United States. The idea there, I think, is that we, if we design the right policies, we can completely, and if we design the right institutions that are hard enough and keep people locked in well enough, that we can completely eliminate all risk of certain kinds of violent crime or reoffending, um, and I think it's a—it's obviously a, a, a very um, the idea of eliminating all risk is kind of unimaginable, and it's something I've studied prisons in Europe, and particularly Scandinavian prisons, and it's something that I've been really struck by as a contrast is that systems that seem to be more humane in their policies and to have shorter sentences or to be more rehabilitative tend to uh, have more of an assumption that mistakes will happen and they have to be metabolized in the system. So people will escape from prison, people will recommit crimes, even when you work hard to rehabilitate them and you have to accept that risk and not let it drive the entire system. And I've been very struck in the United States that our response to the pandemic has been eerily similar to our response to crime, that we think we can eliminate all risk of a virus in our society by making sure that everyone is vaccinated and masked and tested. We've done a bad job of it, but in more liberal coastal cities, and, and that um, if anyone in a school, particularly in schools, right, if any kid in a school gets sick, we just shut the school down entirely for two weeks. We just um, we just shut everything down. And I think it's that idea that we can't tolerate that, that in some 
um, kind of bubbled <laughs> middle class communities, we can't tolerate any risk of crime and we can't tolerate any risk of the virus is, is eerily similar. And so I've been thinking about that in terms of these global politics and listening to you all talk because um, I think, you know, on the one hand, I think of um, other uh, <laughs> other countries in Europe tolerating a bit more risk in ways that seem healthy. On the other hand, I think of a lot of these conversations about eliminating entire social groups, trying to get entire groups of people out of a country or on the other side of a border or into a camp or into a detention center feels very similar to this idea of eliminating totality of risk. And so I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, is risk management in the United States just um, um, kind of just a veneer for labeling someone as other and uh, and isolating them, getting rid of them, putting putting them somewhere else and, and trying to do that in a, in a total way um, and not acknowledging the impossibility of that. So that's just, um, I think, I think a lot about the virus in all of these contexts because uh, it feels very integrated in terms of the lived experience in detention, in prisons, in camps where you are at higher risk, um, but also in terms of the management policies that the way um, we manage these marginalized populations often feels disturbingly similar to, to the way we might think about um, a virus or, or a health problem and, and thinking about, you know, in that analogy, are there are there provocative um, questions to be asked or, or reframings of, of the ways in which the, the risk management leads to new forms of oppression. So um, maybe maybe at least some, some synthesis for, I think, less, less detail about very specific aspects of America, but just kind of thinking about the ways in which I think our system is more, more in dialogue with many of these systems than people, people would generally like to think, um, for better or worse. I look forward to the conversation. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Karamet. Uh, so far, there are there are no questions, um, uh, but I hope that uh, the question uh, box will fill up quickly. Uh, but in order to allow it some time uh, to do so, uh, I am going to ask a question uh, of uh, Darren, uh, and it kind of uh, picking up on two. Um, two things from Karamet's discussion uh, that do seem parallel between the US and, uh, and China are, um, are, are the deployment of, of um, let's say, confinement uh, for the disciplining of labor and, and, and this attempt to eliminate risk. And I'm just actually going to just apologize if this is slightly rambling, but, but a, a few months ago, I had the pleasure of um, examining a PhD on uh, a minority language of, of Sichuan, uh, where someone had collected some texts, um, and one of them was an, a, a real story, you know, from life about uh, a family that um, had tried had, or had repaired their roof, uh, and for doing that, they needed some wood, so they went and collected some wood. Uh, that uh, was within their traditional rights to do so, uh, but because of actually environmental protection legislation uh, in China, uh, uh, th that uh, traditional practice is is now frowned upon, and uh, the head of the household was uh, taken to prison and um, was able to get off um, pretty lightly with some some bribery and um, whatnot. But in prison, uh, there were other people who. Um, who, who, whose political connections or whose, whose access to funds was, was uh, less, so, oh, so were, were beaten up. Um, and um, and it uh, immediately brought to my mind, actually, the, the, the first piece of, as far as I know, the first piece of journalism of Karl Marx, uh, uh, which is called uh, On the Law, uh, no, Debate on the Law of the Thefts of Wood, which was actually, you know, his experience of, of, of in, 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 in Germany of um, landowners kind of uh, uh, ass asserting their property rights vis-a-vis -vis, uh, traditional rights of peasants to collect wood uh, was actually what, you know, radicalized him. And I thought the irony of, you know, this officially communist uh, state <laughs> um, kind of uh, practicing a, 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 for a form of enclosure that actually is very specifically the form of enclosure that made Karl Marx a Marxist. Um, and, um, and so I guess, you know, I, what I'm curious about asking you is, I think that um, it, it, most people have tended to think of what's going on in Xinjiang as quite 
specific to the Uyghurs, but partly from your presentation, I saw it as, or, or I was able to see your presentation as discussing it as part of the, the overall sort of in, enclosure of uh, peasants in, um, in, in China. Uh, yeah, that, that, that you know, it, it may be a particularly extreme and, and a particularly sort of nationalized in terms of the Uyghurs being, being an, uh, uh, one of the nationalities form, but that kind of um, may, 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 maybe the broader phenomenon here is, is one of, of, of enclosures in the service of, of capital accumulation. And I, I wonder if, 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 if you can just say a word about sort of contextualizing the Uyghur situation vis-a-vis -vis other sort of styles of enclosure that are fashionable in China today. Sure. Um, that's a, a great question and a very good point. Um, I mean, the Uyghur region is the farthest you can get from Beijing. Um, and it's it, the land itself um, and space makes it difficult to access. Um, there's mountains and deserts and all that. And so like the railroad didn't get there until quite recently. Um, and they're still building the railroad there um, in, into some areas. Um, so that means that the you know, process of, of bringing infrastructure and putting people on the grid um, is quite recent there. And, and you see that happening in other parts of sort of central to Western China, like in Sichuan, for instance, which is also a site of what they call the Open Up the West um, campaign. Uh, so sure, I mean, what I see in this space is very similar to what Karl Marx saw. Um, it's, you know, capitalist frontier making, it's primitive accumulation, um, which is always ongoing and is often racialized. Um, it's uh, dispossession or, or transformation of something that was formerly held in common into something that can be you know, turned into capital. Um, and it's not limited to land, although land is, of course, important and resources on the land are important. Um, it's also labor. Um, and so the labor market across China is a major factor in what's happening in Xinjiang. Um, you know, it's very similar to, to offshoring labor as we've done in the United States. Um, if, if labor costs are, are too high to, to make the profits you want or to keep the costs low enough, um, you need to find a cheaper labor force. And in Xinjiang, they've, they've made one out of this group of peasants who were not integrated with the economy and can be put to work in, in this way. Um, so so that's, that's certainly a dynamic that's happening. I mean, it, the comparison to Alaska is I think instructive because when you think about if, if, if First Nations Native American folks in Alaska were 15 million people, and the state wanted to come and take their land in order to get access to their oil, which they've done, um, there would have been a response. Um, so you know, it's a similar kind of frontier making dynamic. Um, when it comes to perfect policing um, or the you know, risk management, like that's certainly a factor here. Um, I think there's a, a fetishization of data and, and technology in order to as assist in that kind of policing. And, um, and I think you see that in the US police departments as well, the, the turn to Palantir and these other technological tools to predict uh, behavior or to, um, to be there kind of on the spot before the or as the crime is happening. Um, not realizing, I think that there's so much bias built into this that the, that the definitions of what count as crime are a huge factor in what determines um, how crime is assessed. Um, yeah, you know, over 80% of, in some cities in the US of, of, of black American men have a police file, a digitized police file on record. And so when a police officer pulls someone over or they pull up that police file immediately and that you know, goes into their assessment of that person's behavior. So um, yeah, the technology placed in service to policing and, and to, to prison management is, is a huge factor in, in both of these contexts. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so now uh, there is a question, and this is from uh, Mary Gallagher at, uh, at, at, at UCD. Uh, so uh, she would, would like to ask of Annette, uh, could you say a little bit more about how you, how you see performance, agency, and 
and and totalitarianism, or in, in your um, in, in your terms, the total institution uh, relating to each other in those camps that you have studied, and more specifically, who has agency? Uh, um, is this the agency to perform one thing when someone is looking, and something else when uh, when not observed? Uh, thank you very much for this question. Okay, um, I have to read it again. I'm wondering if Annette could say a little more about how the C's performance agency and totalitarian relate to each other in those camps that she studied. I mean, I try to describe that the totalitarianism is not um, something which is just there. People have to perform it people have to constantly create it and this has to be done and so agency also refers kind of to the wardens to the people who look after uh, refugees so the agency the term agency is not only related to refugees but also to the people who actually run the institution and the case of refugee camps is uh, special because you have refugee representatives who are elected or named by refugees themselves. So it's different from other total institutions, but still I think uh, this is something we have to be aware of and which is not um, much discussed uh, and also not much recognized, especially by camp theory. And the other question, I hope, this answer is enough and more specifically who has agency yet I mean agency is related not only to the refugees but to the people who are locally present actually and run the system um, yeah is it allowed also for the panelists to raise questions uh, yes, please. Uh, I was I actually going like to, to. I was going uh, to ask for that. Yeah. <laughs> then I would like to um, ask um, a question, namely um, for all panelists. Actually, are the phenomena that I described also known in relations to your cases, or um, is that something very specific or is it something that can only be described for refugee camps then since there is i guess more openness there to help shape or establish camp life so the performance of duty by the book and the falsification of documents to fit the local circumstances better so like just as an example, those two examples, is that something that you also know from your um, um, cases? I, if I can, I, Annette, I was really struck by the similarities to that and solitary confinement in the United States. Um, in California, there's, I think there's, there's been a lot of litigation. And so some of the best data, it's often completely hidden, right? <laughs> like how, how these kinds of things are being defined, but, um, people in California could be labeled a gang member by prison guards and then sent to solitary confinement indefinitely until a lawsuit in the early 2000s. And um, increasingly, the more, um, and, and the labeling as a gang member could be done by just any three pieces of evidence. So like if you had a tattoo, the kind of book you were reading, the kind of um, letters you might be writing to or people you were socializing with. And it turns out that not only was it just incredibly broad, this idea of gang membership that could get you sent into solitary, but a lot of the information, um, the prison system would just say, well, it's confidential, we can't tell you because we'd put other people who told us at risk. And it turns out a lot of it never existed or was false or incorrect. Um, so that that was a striking parallel to me, right? Of where it's really, it's really hard to see what's happening, but it's something I've written a lot about in the United States is that these prison officials on the ground do have an incredible amount of agency in how they um, control the laws that define these populations. So I thought that was a really interesting parallel. Um, does does anyone else want to address Annette's um, question? I mean, I, I suppose that um, both in Xinjiang and in Assam, uh, there's it's it's not really possible to do ethnographic work inside of the camps. So. Well, I could I could respond quickly just based on my interviews with former detainees. Like, 
Sure, then both of those things that you mentioned are there. I mean, the, the higher level officials come to inspect the camps, you know, fairly regularly. Um, and there's, you know, performances that are done for them when they arrive um, that, you know, cultural performances. They do the same for the journalists or diplomats that visit it too. Um, and some of the former detainees talk about participating in that and how it was a break from the drudgery of, of normal life. Um, there's also um, spaces where beatings happen um, that are off camera. There's, um, in at least one case, the, a woman was said that they were struck in the head um, if they spent too much time on the toilet um, because they the bruises wouldn't show there. Um, so that, you know, there's a, there's, it seems as though it's going the other way. It's not about good camp governance or, or maybe the, the be people that are doing the beating think it is, um, but it's, it's really about hiding some of the brutality from people, people higher up in command. Um, and uh, so, so there's that aspect and, and then falsifying numbers. I and mean, there's a quota system associated with how many people you should detain. Um, and I think it, and in some cases there's, there's very likely inflation um, because people wanna, sh the local officials wanna show how invested they are in the, in the program. Um, and so, uh, you know, they might say they have higher numbers of people detained or, or people um, assigned jobs and, and things like that. Um, I'm sure there's, there's a lot of slippage um, in, in how all of that's done, but a, a lot of it seems to be about maintaining, you know, personal um, power rather than a, about good governance. In, sorry, uh, can I go ahead, Nathan? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, um, so just uh, while you were um, asking the question, and I kind of brought up some bits of the of the model detention center guidance that the um, that the government has put in place, or has has recommended that states um, follow while they're building up these detention centers. So it contains stuff like you know um, there should be lady wardens to ensure that women have adequate security. Um, there should be proper connections of, um, of gas connections to each kitchen. Um, you need to have um, schools for children, creches for children. Um, there should be things like, you know, good, good hygiene, good drinking water, stuff to, what's the, yeah, uh, to maintain living standards and constants with human dignity. So you have stuff like that as well. So, but you can imagine that when the camps actually become, come to, um, exist and come to operation, life will be much different. Um, and in terms of this idea of performing, um, it, it's interesting because this kind of parallels with performing citizenship also, um, which are constantly looked at, looked at as suspects. So within, for example, in the citizens, in the foreigners tribunals, like I said, you had to bring documents to show that you're a foreigner, right? So, I mean, there are, some 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 petitioners, people who claim to be Indian citizens, will go with all these documents, and the um, the, the ju judge will say, no, these are all fake documents. I can tell by looking at them that they're fake documents, um, or that the fact that they have documents themselves indicates, or they have adequate documentation ind indicates that they um, there was some dishonesty behind bringing those documents. Um, that if you are a true Indian citizen, who, what, what kind of Indian citizen has this many, this many documents? Um, so that's kind of the logic as well. Um, so in some cases, I mean, um, another ethnographer I was speaking to talked about these cases where this one particular judge said, um, basically looked at having documentation as a form, as a, as a problem. Um, because, you know, if you have documentation, either it's fake, um, either you've bought it off someone else, or it's, it's completely fabricated. Um, okay, I, so um, let, let me just, you know, exhort uh, our audience to, to supply us with a few more questions. You're somehow being very shy. Um, but, but I'd like to ask a question of Mayur, uh, kind of in keeping with the, what I was talking to Darren about earlier. Uh, you, you didn't touch on... Um, the the sort of economic side of things very much, but I assume that um, in, in India with with quite or a relatively free press, I think that the, the business the business community uh, would have opined uh, to some extent on what's going on, and 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 there 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 might be a sense of 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 different uh, business interests and how they feel about what's happening in Assam or at the national level. Is there anything you can say about that? 
No, actually, when when um, Darren was speaking earlier and in response to your question, I was thinking, is there an economic or kind of analysis that one can make of Assam? Um, because it's it's almost like a flip version over here. Whereas, I mean, if if um, because what who's being incarcerated is not the the natives, but is the perceived to be the outsiders. Um, so in Assam itself, I think, I mean, my general sense of speaking to the few people I have spoken to is that there's, amongst Assamese, there's, there's um, amongst the liberal kind of Assamese, there's kind of great um, ambivalence about the project, not simply because on one hand, they're very concerned about this loss of identities, this idea of a loss of identity comes very, comes through very strongly. Um, but kind of the liberal Assamese are like, you know, what are we doing with the, with the, with the Bengali population? We can't just, you know, chuck them out. Um, but I think um, the, so the, the, where the kind of protests came was with, with regard to the Citizenship Amendment Act. That's when the big protests happened and across India, um, because that was the first time in which citizenship um, was con contingent upon one's religion. So basically, it, to, to apply for Indian citizenship from certain countries, you could had to be Hindu, Christian, Jain, Sikh, um, uh, Jain, Sikh, and Buddhist, right? You could not be Muslim, right? And so that was that was the big um, um, kind of the big break. That's when the big just before the pandemic, there were um, big protests throughout the country um, around that. But the NRC itself um, hasn't attracted the kind of protest that there, it's attracted protest in the sense that it's not been efficient enough at eradicating foreigners um, within Assam. Um, outside Assam, it's a different matter, but within Assam itself, it's 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 been about how um, ineffective it's been. But that I haven't answered your question, which is I, I can't think of an economic analysis of it. Um, and I need to think of it more deeply. At the, at the okay. Um, well, thank you. Uh, anyhow, uh, now I'll just mention that s someone had uh, a hand up, and and we, we can't actually the way that things are set up, I can't sort of turn to you to speak. So you'll see that there's a, a question and answer uh, spot. Uh, uh, so so you can please put your questions. It, it's in the lower right in the question uh, spot, although it looks like there's maybe someone. Oh, no, that's that's uh, Maeve. OK, so another question from from uh, Mary and this one to Mayor. Um, is there any sense in which uh, people of, of uh, let's say, mixed ethnic background, Bengali plus something else, are seen as having a doubtful uh, identity, um, and which would be would, which would be contingently rational in a way? Um. So the 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 thing is, the categories don't map easily onto each other. And the, so the social category of Bengali versus Assamese doesn't map onto Indian citizen quite well, right? Quite easily. Um, so um, I think socially um, you would be seen, there's a big distinction between Bengali and Assamese. And because of the way in which Indian society functions, I think if your father is Bengali, you would be seen as Bengali. Um, but legally, or in the foreigners' tribunals, it's different because there's it, technically, at least, there's no there's no Bengali identity card, or as a no Assamese identity card. Um, so it's and that's that that's the kind of the fault line around which the the resistance or the inadequacy, the perceived inadequacy of the NRC in Assam is based on because it hasn't done a good enough job of um, removing the Bengalis. Um, and again, the other layer is, you know, Hindu versus Muslim that the national government is portraying it through. Um, so it's these, there are three sets of categories that don't map well onto each other. And, and that's where you think the fault lines are. So just to paraphrase then, then um, um, there's like, it, like it may be the case that the exercise has sort of vindicated the citizenship of, of Assamese uh, uh, differentially. Uh, but there is no uh, explicit mechanism by which this happens legally. It's it's kind of um, yeah. It 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 sort of seeps in through the cracks, kind of. Yeah. Which is why the the date on for the Assam for the Assam uh, uh, in the Assam Accord is a date. It's not 
who is Assamese, who is Bengali. It's, if you've come into the state after March 25th, 1971, then you are an outsider. Uh, okay, so we're, we still don't really have any, maybe everyone is just so you know blown away by these great presentations that they're going to have to cogitate for the coming days. Um, uh, but but then I will ask a, a, a question of of uh, of Darren and I, I sort of apologize to everyone for sort of you know pursuing my personal interests uh, maybe too much here but it's your fault for not asking questions uh, which is you know, I've been thinking about that uh, um, you know that that let's say the uh, the Ch the China is in a very different sort of development moment than uh, mature Western countries. And uh, part of that uh, is reflected by uh, the, 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 let's say, the perceived need or the, or the let's say, or let's say the, the imminent need to, to, to discipline workers in a certain way. And, um, and then I found myself thinking about that, um, you know, in, in, in the West, in the US in particular, there was a moment then where like Taylorism and Fordism were, were really what you studied if you like went to business school, yeah? Uh, was like, you know, how to tell like a, uh, someone exactly how to cut a piece of metal. Yeah. And, um, and uh, on the one hand, it seems like that's very much the moment we're in, in terms of big data and, and this analytics and that this sort of, this sort of effort to, to move control down to the sort of uh, physical biological level is there. But on the other hand, in terms of the sort of the sort of superstructure, it feels like, um, you know, how you train people to discipline labor has moved really far away from that. And like business schools are all about just sort of learning how to be a leader and, <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> and, and, and then that means that sort of the, the, the China, the, you know, the, uh, to the extent that China interacts with, with the West in uh, higher education, you have all these people coming back to China who really have the wrong skill set for the for that for the moment of development that China is at. So I've been thinking about that, but then it's manifestly the case that it's not a problem, right? That <laughs> that, 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 that they're they're managing somehow to um, to you know keep you know GDP pretty high and and to enclose their their peasants and whatnot. So it sounds like this is sort of I mean, sort of paraphrasing, I think what you said is that, that, that those skills are coming, you know, whereas in the late 19th century, or early 20th century in, in the West, they would have come largely from the business community. Um, it, it, it really is partly uh, in, in kind of, um, I, don't, I, I mean, I, I, I forget the words you use, but po policing studies, anti-terrorist studies, Sort of military policing technologies that that China has been learning those skills in a sort of scientific way. Does that sound right to you? Or uh, yes, um, I think the the war on terror has played out in a lot of different ways um, and, and unexpected ways. It's built the security surveillance state surveillance systems. Um, and in a lot of contexts in the US and in China, um, partnerships between private enterprise, you know, like Amazon uh, developing face recognition uh, tools and things like that, um, those partnerships have really um, expanded the toolbox of, of what's available for large technology firms. Um, but I would also add something about a neo-Taylorist uh, approach to manufacturing and consumption. Logistics studies is showing a lot of this. Um, so when you think about, you know, the Amazon warehouse and how, you know, the, 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 the warehouse workers are monitored, you know, in every way um, from like wearable devices to um, time, time signatures and, 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 and maintaining the rate of you know, when the order is made, to when it's delivered, all of that stuff, um, the, you know, compressing space through time. That's coming out of the West at the same time as it's being built in, in China. So like automation and smart manufacturing is, is happening in China. And we see that playing out in the factory floor in many places in China. 
but it, it, particularly in the in the Uyghur region, where surveillance of the body and of, of workers is is really um, amplified in in a new way. Um, so, so I wouldn't say that it's um, completely separated from that history of Taylorism and and, and stuff that you were thinking about. Um, and it's bringing me to a question that I'd like to ask of the other panelists, um, which has to do with detainability um, and how it has, you know, once you, if you can be detained, it has a, a lot of effects in terms of what labor choices are available, what life is available to you. Um, and in the U.S., we see that happening with, um, you know, undocumented folks being pushed into certain kinds of work. Um, and so I'd love to hear um, if, if Karamet has any thoughts on that. And I, I, I wonder, Mayur, if, if there's you know, certain occupations that are available to unfree people that could be put in a camp whose citizenship is, is suspect, or if they are just fully you know, excluded from the economy. Um, is there some jobs that are still there for them? Is there a place and they just need to know their place kind of out of sight in the gray economy on the margins of society? I don't know about the context of, of Thailand and Myanmar um, and, and what sort of work people are, are, are doing there. Um, but if you're outside of the camp, but you could be put in a camp, does that affect you know, what, what life path is available to you? Okay, so who wants to, this is a great question, who wants to address it first? I'll think out loud unless my or you look like you're, <laughs> you're still thinking. Um, so I thought, I think the status of, of detainability or, or I framed it in the past as, as excludability also is really powerful. And I thought about this, I've written with a colleague who looks at um, deportation and thinking about how placement into solitary confinement is similar to deportation as, an, as a status of excludability. Um, and I'm really intrigued by this idea of can, as I understand your question, can that status labor? And I, I think that at least in the US context, some of, some of the ideas that that status can't labor, right? They are just completely, like rather than killing them, we just put them into a black hole to the extent we possibly can. And, and part of the point is that there is no valuable labor. And so even, so that's true in solitary confinement, right? And with deportation, right? That we just assume that there's absolutely no labor to be extracted at all. But I think even within the prison context in the United States, right? We hear about like prison work that happens. Like there are, there are incarcerated people in California who help fight wildfires. And there are people who man call centers, but the, it's work that is, um, often most of the prison work that happens is just managing the prison, right? Like cleaning or delivering mail or cooking. Um, and it, so it feels often like work that's just being created, right? Um, and, the, and the workers, like the people who man the call centers or the firefighters, it's been a big issue in California, the people who fight fires, they're not allowed to do that work when they leave prison. Um, and in fact, there are kind of more like expert professionalized people supervising and doing that work who aren't um, detainable or excludable. So I, in some ways it it more feels to me like like we're there is like part of the status of the pure excludability is having no labor and and that we're um and and we're making sure there is no possible um like it, it's almost like we're just sort of trying to get rid of the body as excess bodies rather than even thinking there could be any labor to be extracted but I, I don't know I'm curious I'm curious what others think it's a really interesting question. Real quick, yeah. Before we move on, it's a, like what I was thinking about is like the people that work in the chicken plants um, that pick our strawberries, um, who are pushed into into you know who aren't documented, um, but how like there's certain jobs that are available to them that are actually really essential to our economy, um, but aren't discussed in that way, and you know they're placed in that sort of work path in large part because they don't have documentation and could potentially be deported or detained. Um, so that's a, a little bit of where I, where I was thinking. Not, not so much in the prison context, I guess, quite as much. Although, you know, it's interesting, Darren, because now I'm thinking like some of, so when, I, when, when I've written about excludability, I've said it's created, it creates this kind of liminal space where people seek to be non-excludable, 
And I wonder if that's some of like that population of people who do that, that work, right. That is necessary, like the strawberry picking or the, um, but, but that, that isn't necessarily desirable. Um, I think some of it, you know, I think some of the really interesting work happening in the United States now is about the these people, the ways in which we strip people of their labor rights. So it would be deportable people, but it would also be people with criminal records who through all kinds of legal constructions end up in positions where they have to work um, in order to not be excluded, um, but they have to take really dangerous illegal work functionally that's like <laughs> that's, that's like truly extractive. Um, and so I think maybe those two things are tied, right? That we have, we first create a category of total excludability with no work. And then there's a category of these detainable people who can only do subpar work, but they kind of rely on the excludable category because they're only doing it to defend themselves, to define themselves as not excludable. Um, I, I don't know, it's an idea to play with. So I, I just feel compelled to to uh, mention, uh, you know, anecdotally that, um, you know, I, I've been living in the U or had been living in the UK for for a while before moving to Ireland, and um, uh, uh, knew someone who was applying. Actually, I've known a couple of people who have applied for asylum there, and uh, the asylum process can drag on for years, you know, three four years, uh, and you are not allowed to work during that process. And and the question of like, well, how do you, you know. Um, how do you kind of succeed in securing your social reproduction during that time is something that the state, you know, uh, has no opinion on, uh, which means that effectively, uh, uh, you know, working in, in dangerous or, or Ill illegal uh, work is, is, is countenanced pretty explicitly, but always with the threat that, you know, if, if you happen to be found to be working, then you can be immediately deported. Yeah. Um, so that's... Mm -hmm. Sounds yeah, relevant to me. Yeah, please, Annette. Yeah, uh, I mean the the case in Myanmar, Thailand is very different. I would say, um, I mean, there's a complex, also historical and political background of the refugee situation in Thailand with Myanmar, because camp residents belong to actually ethnic groups who live in the borderland area of Myanmar and Thailand. And there are very, very strong networks and relations between camp residents and illegal people, so to say, and Burmese and Thai villagers, politicians and um, people. So um, as well as between camp residents and residents to Thai cities and Thai uh, and uh, Burmese villages and Burmese cities. So there's a very strong uh, network also um, that um, is quite independent of, of what Bangkok and Yangon, so to say the national state policies um, want them to um, do. So um, there's strong and diverse local political, but also business relations that extend the boundaries of the nation state and which are um, which are rooting in historical um, in this historical very strong yeah the ethnic groups which are um, yeah and um, of course um, there's a lot of illegal working practices going on in those um, areas and along the borders. And I also um, observed that um, in other border regions in Asia, um, that the, the um, local border areas are really very different and the practices are very different on, on what um, state policies, state politics want people to do. Um, um, yeah, so there is, of course, a lot of illegal working practices. I'm never sure whether people, um, like local people, really perceive that as illegal. It is made to be illegal by state politics um, uh, or national politics, but locally, regional, it is like a really different story. And so um, the illegal working practices are business as usual, but also, uh, but also for police officers um, who are yeah, kind of 
tolerating those um, local practices. But of course, there are also controls and there are also people who are put in detention or they're sent back across the border. Um, but yeah, that's, um, yeah. So this is more differentiated picture. I think I would like to draw um, it is not that clear what is illegal, who is illegal to whom. Uh, of course, to the state, they're illegal, and to the politics, they're illegal, national politics. But what is going on locally and between the people and between uh, local governance also and local business people? So that's a different story. Uh, can I just follow up uh, kind of with to ask you for a little bit more detail? I mean, um... Um, the, the it's um yeah so there I mean you, you refer to these sort of ethnic groups of the of 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 the the hills let's say and and I mean I'm more familiar with the Sino Burmese border area but there are these people like the Jinpo or the Hani who who kind of exist across all all these states uh, and and have traditionally maintained quite strong um, sense of solidarity even across borders. Uh, but I have the, uh, and, 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 you know, let's say they were relatively open borders. Yeah, although they're very, you know, high mountainous regions, so they might not seem very open, you know, to me, but if you live there, it's quite open. Um, but I have the impression that, that, that at least, uh, um, I, you know, I, I don't know this for sure, but that, that the Chinese state uh, un, under the aegis of, um, you know, public health, uh, in, in, in the COVID-19 crisis has actually put some kind of big fence uh, along the Sino-Burmese border. Uh, and I had just taken for granted that in the context of the recent uh, coup d'etat in, in Burma, that a lot of people would be trying to rapidly uh, leave Burma. And I've, I've heard about this on the, on the Indian side, actually. And that consequently, the, the neighboring state has found it, uh, let's say, um, have found reason to 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 uh, try to police that border much more strenuous uh, sort of stridently than it had traditionally and i'm just wondering whether you you can comment at all about sort of very recent developments on the on the the um the sort of uh, 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 burmo thai border i mean the thai burmese border is very very long and it is with uh, mountains and it is like um, so I never I didn't hear about um, yeah practices of the poli Thai police to more to be more strict or something like that I mean until now I haven't heard about um, something like that so I'm but I'm not I don't I'm yeah I'm not there at the moment so I yeah. can't, uh, can't you can't, don't know yeah, sorry <laughs> Uh, okay, well, we're slowly um, running. Oh, look, there's some questions. Um, oh, yeah, okay. So, and then this will be the, uh, I think this will be the last question from the audience, and then I'll give people, a, you know, a, a, I don't know, a, <laughs> whether you want to or not, a, a um, an opportunity for a short uh, uh, synthesis uh, before we, you know, uh, part ways. Uh, so this is uh, the question, what are examples, I guess it's to, to anyone, what are examples of where internment has been or is being done well or properly? Uh, if it's accepted that internment can't always be avoided, is research being carried out on how it can be done better? Well, I mean, I, I think that we've spoken quite a lot about um, research on how it can be done better, but I, I, I guess the question is, which I was sort of expecting earlier, um, a sort of normative or, or moral one, which is it, which I will paraphrase as, is there a way that, is, is there any kind of metric uh, that a third party can, can decide uh, looking at an internment situation, whether or not it can be called sort of a good internment or bad internment? Uh, I don't, yeah, and, and <laughs> maybe rather than asking each of you to, to answer that sort of personally, you can say whether in, in the discipline that you're involved in, uh, has there been a discussion on that kind of, uh, let's say, deontological question, right, of, 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 uh, of, of, of moral internment. <laughs> 
I mean, I can uh, say a few words to the case of refugee camps. Um, actually, voices are very, very rare that say refugee camps is a, a good solution. Or so actually, um, scholars have shared a very critical perception of refugee camps and the reestablishment of camps. So um, there are very, very few voices. And even UNHCR, who manages camps worldwide, uh, does not want to build camps and establish camps. So um, I think scholars are quite, um, yeah, um, how to say, united in the, um, in the perception that camps and refugee camps are not a solution on long term, maybe on very, very short term, where when you really have to like deal with mass influxes of people, um, may, this might be um, a solution, but um, um, yeah, very, very short term only. Um, but this is uh, not the case. So worldwide, I mean, the camp, uh, the existence of camps average is around 20 years or even more. In the case of Burmese refugee camps, it's like more than um, uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, we all know the camps in Palestine. So um, this is not um, realistic that refugee camps are really a short-term temporary solution. So that's why we should think about different solutions um, at right at the beginning when we have max, mass influxes of people. I just can't resist saying I want everyone else to answer that, but, but uh, you know, I, I, my uncle uh, was born in the Sudetenland and was put on a train uh, when he was five years old. It's one of his first memories is being sprayed by an American soldier for, you know, some kind of delousing or something. Uh, and, and he was just, you know, um, uh, his family was just given to a family in Potsdam and they said, not, no, uh, no, not Potsdam. Anyhow, it doesn't pass out, pass out in the South. Uh, they said, you know, here's your refugee family. Uh, please take good care of them. <laughs> and um, I, it's easy to understand why this is not an, a frequently used solution, but it worked extremely well, at least in the case of, of, of that family. They remain very, very close, uh, those two families. Uh, and I'm, it does surprise me a little bit more that that's, that solution is not... Uh, contemplated uh, more often, but it's easy to understand why and we don't need to talk about it. Um, maybe Karamit. Um, I mean, if you, if you accept my argument that camps and prisons are somewhat continuous, right, as, as places of, of containment or exclusion, then, then I, I think at least from the prison perspective, um, there's certainly an active conversation about abolition and whether prisons are necessary in the United States and increasingly associated with the, the question of policing, right? And whether police are, as I think, I think the, the, the dialogue around policing has put abolition more on the public consciousness than it was before and made it, made it more of a central debate. Um, and, I, and I personally think that much like a refugee camp, I mean, I think the extent to which we accept prisons as potentially um, humane or, or could be made good, whereas there's a sort of acceptance in human rights that a refugee camp can't is a little bit disturbing because I, I think in a lot of ways they're extremely similar. Um, but I think on the other hand, there's a much, maybe a more robust history and, and debate in, in criminology and, and prison history and law about um, how to make a prison humane and whether that's an ethical project. And, and I guess I, the most helpful framework I have to think about it is that, you know, there are, there are going to be short-term contexts in which people need to be detained and we do have prisons and they are terrible and they're not going to, we're not going to wave a magic wand and they're not going to go away. And so there's this question of how you think about the interim. And um, at least for me, I think about the interim in, in terms of trying to do things that, that don't reinforce the system and make it easier to build it up and rather kind of um, break the system down and, and make it easier to, to shrink it or eliminate it. And so, you know, when I think about, you know, for instance, like, I don't want to give prison officials a lot of money to educate prisoners. I want to give universities money to educate prisoners. Just as one very small example, right, in terms of just like literally thinking about how you allocate resources. Um, and, and similarly, right, with Nathan's example, right, it's about diffusing these these marginalized groups back into the community, exactly as you were saying, with a family that stays with another family. And so how do you 
how do you um, direct resources to build up that possibility in, in the interim between having no camps or having no prisons? But I think the idea of like setting standards for a good prison potentially is something that reinforces the, the or setting standards for a good camp is something that reinforces the necessity of it and makes it seem okay. And so that, that process itself is potentially troubling. Yeah, I mean, now I'm going to really, I sort of apologize for editorializing, but, but in, in preparing this event, a lot of people sort of said like, oh, you know, oh, you know, I would say, oh, we're going to have a talk about this, talk about this. And then, and then most people said, well, yeah, fine, but, but we need prisons, right? And, <laughs> and even, even people are quite far left. And that sort of, let's say, historically, that surprised me because like, I, and someone I've read on this is Emma Goldman, who's like, you know, uh, and a feminist anarchist from the, from the 19th century. And she has a, 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 you know, a very well thought through discussion of like, yeah, there will be murderers, yeah, but that doesn't mean there have to be prisons. Yeah, there, there, it, 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 it depends on what the overall structure of social relations are like, yeah. uh, which is, it sounds like what you're sa saying maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, so maybe Darren, do you have, uh, you, you 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 can you can try and make a crack at this sort of deal deontological question or or offer any other kind of uh, overall syn synthesis if you want. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, I think I'm in agreement with with the other panelists um, that you know internment and imprisonment is not a good solution um, to problems in society. Um, you know, I think you know the the first step should be you know demilitarization should be decolonization and anti-racism, um, you, know, you know, moving for, building for social justice, those sorts of things. But right, in the interim, what do we do? Um, well, I mean, one of the things I see in camps and prisons in China and everywhere else is a process of dehumanization of, of prisoners um, and detainees. Um, and so, you know, bringing the human back into it and, and building more just prisons, I think is, is the way to go. I mean, I've, I've, when I teach about prisons in, in college classrooms, like students are, they ask that question, well, what should we do? And you know, abolition is, is something we can talk about and, and should, um, but I think you know, the, the sort of research that, that you're likely doing, Kermet, in, in Scandinavia is usually where I go and, and I show them what those prisons look like, where there's a much stronger emphasis on rehabilitation, where um, you know, the, the ratio of guards to prisoners or detainees is, is much lower, um, is much less securitized. Um, people are actually taught sort of how to live or given a pathway to live and to learn trades and, and things like that. Um, and they're not, or at least in the, in the presentations I've seen, not dehumanized in such an extreme way. So I think being intentional about that in, in prison uh, management is, is, is useful in the short term. Um, but yeah, in general, I would say internment, imprisonment, not a good solution. Uh, and uh, Meyer, you'll, and you'll, you'll have the final word, basically. <laughs> um, just generally, I agree. I think um, I, I, there's no way of answering the what's a good question, what's a good pr prison without having kind of blinkers on to see kind of the, the, um, the ways in which um, prisons are dehumanizing and the ways in which they are political that they target certain populations. Um, so I don't think there is a good, a good prison. Um, I mean, there is, there's an answer given in kind of like management, prison management, I'm sure. Um, you have to have certain square meters per person or whatever, but we know that prisons are always overcrowded anyways. Um, so you just build bigger prisons, which kind of exacerbates the problem. But um, I, I mean, it's, it's, I think what, um, what Dan said about humanizing in an interim, I think, is important to think about. Um, and I, I, I don't think I have an answer to the the precise question of what's a good prison. So I, I'm a little curious though, because you're you're a, a, a lawyer, right? So so there must be an answer, right? There. <laughs> yeah. There, there is a human rights answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Which is, you know, you can't be. You have to have regularity. You you have to have be able to have communication. You have to, um, you know, have you know proper sanitary conditions. You have to have right to access to education. So that's a human rights answer, right? And and what's the mechanism for that human rights answer being sort of uh, enshrined, for example, in India? Um. 
in India, you just have to go to court and get it get it enforced. So, oh, for okay. example, like you'd have, for example, I know people who have, have been given um, from my previous research on terrorism trials who weren't given access to writing materials. They had to go to court and say, okay, I need a pen and paper. I need to be able to send stuff. Um, or you go to your trial judge and say, um, I need to meet my family at least once a week, stuff like that. Um, um, I know other jurisdictions have things like ombudsman, um, other mechanisms to kind of ensure prison fairness, but any system like that just kind of breaks down into, um, I think, at least the system that I know of, kind of break down into forms of brutality and dehumanization. Uh, okay, well, um, uh, let me uh, thank everyone who uh, has attended. Uh, and uh, Wait, they, oh yes, fine, yes, yes, please. Um, because I think we have to differentiate then also um, who is interned. And of course, uh, if uh, certain people are in internment and then we have a human rights answer, it's totally correct. But in the context of people fleeing fighting, fleeing from conflict and fleeing from violence, I don't think that a human rights answer is enough. Uh, I think uh, we should avoid camps or all kind of in in forms of internment when we talk about people who are fleeing from violence. Um, so I'm not sure if um, the humanitarian or uh, human rights answer is in, in that specific case is, uh, is enough. Sorry. I, I mean, are, are you thinking kind of because of, let's say, I mean, to, to, to speak very sort of... Uh, because I think we need to think and we need to establish and um, yeah, uh, think about different solutions. We need different solutions. And uh, we cannot say we don't have other solutions. So we use uh, 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 camps, you know? So we have to really avoid the camp solution, not only avoid, but to really um, say, this is not a solution and uh, think about other solutions. I guess what, what I'm confused by is, is you're, you're saying that people freeing from, fleeing from violence is a special case. And I don't, I don't, let's say, I don't necessarily disagree, but sort of, you know, in Assam or whatnot, no one's fleeing from violence, but I don't think that necessarily, like prima facie doesn't mean that a human rights solution is more appropriate. But I just don't want to say that generally, forms of internment are um, not a solution. Maybe for specific phenomena, for specific social, I don't know, um, internment is some kind of solution that is, um, I don't know, properly with a human rights answer. Uh, but for refugee camps, I don't see that. Yeah, okay, I see that's clear. Um, okay, well, then I will go back to my perfunctory, you know, uh, uh, sort of sh shutting things down. So uh, I've already thanked the audience. Now I uh, will thank each of our, our panelists. I certainly um, felt like this was extremely uh, informative and, and enjoyable and a different kind of conversation on some of these issues than, than I've been hearing. So I'm very grateful uh, to all of you for making that possible. Uh, and then I also just want to again um, thank uh, Maeve, who has been, you know, silently and secretly um, keeping this all uh, running smoothly. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, oh, and we're already over time. Actually, that's funny. I, I guess uh, time goes quickly. Uh, so then, um, you know, um, we can stop there and uh, maybe you know have a little round of applause for our speakers. Yeah. <laughs>